Thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Carrie Jensen, and I'm a landscape designer at HT Harvey and Associates. I'm also an ISA certified arborist. But titles aside, I think of myself most of all as a gardener. Is there a microphone? Um, we don't have a microphone here. I'll try to talk loud. I I am soft spoken, so I'll try to be cognizant. Um, where was I? Oh, I'm a gardener. <laughs> When it comes down to it, I love to get my hands dirty, and I love challenges, and one of the most challenging places I've found to garden and get plants in the ground is the park strip, so I'm here today to try to help you learn from my experiences, teach you how to do a park strip garden. I'm going to go through what is a park strip garden, why are they important, and how to make one, particularly a native one. So what are park strips? There are those nasty spaces that nobody knows what to do with between the road and the sidewalk. And usually they're just paved over as concrete if, if people don't want to maintain them. Ooh, yes. Yeah, or I've even seen where there was space to plant trees, but they filled it up just because they didn't want to deal with it. Or if nobody's claimed it, they can be complete like cesspools. <laughs> or weed patches, but they have a lot more potential than that, as I'm sure you all know. They can be gardens, and unfortunately, well, from my perspective, a lot of people, this looks nice, but lawns, um, in this small space with the overspray from lawns, or from the sprinklers, causes a lot of other environmental problems, which I'll talk about. So even though this is better than a weed patch or a cesspool for many reasons, it's not the best. We can get even better, <laughs> like with uh, vibrant gardens with drought tolerant plants, including many, many natives. And you can even take it to another level, which I don't expect from the um, homeowner stance, but I just want to show this as an example. The SFPUC, or San Francisco Public Utilities Commission in San Francisco, they just redid their headquarters as like weed gold or something of that sort. And their park strip in front of their building actually treats the black water like from the toilets and everything inside their building yeah. it goes through and underneath this park strip is a filtration system where the plants help in the first process of cleaning their their black water of their building so park strips can be used a lot better than they currently are <laughs> was my point why are they so important i have lots of reasons the blame will bore you with my long long list but um First being is the urban heat island effect. So you can tell from the photo, like in urban areas where everything's covered in concrete and asphalt, all of that absorbs heat throughout the day and it actually increases the entire temperature across the city. So compared to the, the countryside outside of the city, it can be several degrees, a lot hotter than it is on the outside. And that causes a lot of problems with air quality as well as just, um, increased costs for air conditioning and also health effects from heat borne illnesses. And we can make it a lot better by planting trees in those empty spaces. Mm. So that's a before and after of this space in San Jose where you had just concrete and just take that little space, fill it with a tree, and then eventually as this tree grows bigger, we'll have a lot more shade and this space will have a lot less heat. Do you remember where that is, Carrie? It's okay. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I could look it up. That's okay. The second reason um, park strips are important is for carbon sequestration. And um, you can just imagine how much carbon these trees sequester and keep within their living systems. With all of the global climate change concerns, I think trees and <coughs> park spaces have a lot to contribute in helping with that problem. And also for reducing costs and energy. Those trees create shade for the houses particularly on the southern side of the street, that they're not using their air conditioning and saving energy. Health benefits. Um, I'm sure everybody's aware of the health concerns in this country and the increase in obesity. Children obesity is up by 50% and adolescent obesity is up by a third or something in the last 10, 20 years. It's, it's incredible, right? Like it's a problem for our whole society. And we need to find ways to get people up out of their chairs, out of their cars, away from the television, and out and enjoying spaces. And instead of, I think, debating about healthcare costs, why not get everybody outside and enjoying and living 
healthy lifestyles and by creating parks that are in the park strip, which is essentially a linear park all the way around your street, you can help encourage people to do that and live a healthy lifestyle. There's lots of wildlife benefits. Um, I'm a landscape designer who specializes in habitat restoration, so for me, the wildlife part is a really big deal. And when people think about habitat restoration, usually I think people think of creating big open spaces out in uh, open space districts for big animals like lions and tigers and bears or something. But obviously, those aren't very compatible with the urban environment. And most people don't want to encourage big animals <laughs> in their backyards. But there's still tons of space for lots of little creatures, such as hummingbirds, all kinds of birds. Uh, bees, all of our pollinators, lizards. My yard is like a lizard sanctuary. I don't know where they came from, but I planted natives, and they're, they're all over the place. And even all kinds of uh, organisms that live in the soil. If we cover the whole earth in concrete, there's no space for all of those creatures as well. Fungi, I geek out and take pictures of everything that pops up out of the ground in my yard. <laughs> I get so excited. I found that in my park strip. And you can tell it's a huge larva, and this is what it turned into. Oh, it's a fig eater beetle. I don't know if anybody's seen those there in your compost. Um, what kind of fig eater. They're uh, native to Southern California, and an entomologist told me they've been moving north as more and more people have had compost bins. Wow. They've been able to expand their territory. And I found one of their grubs in, or the larva, in my park strip. So, Another reason to consider park strips is that they help decrease crime. So when you think of a crime-ridden area of the city, do you think of something like this, where there's uh, street trees, a quiet street, or do you imagine more like the dark alleyways of Gotham City? <laughs> <laughs> Trick question, right? Um, so the reason most people think of like the alleyways of Gotham is that there's there's no plants, right? The the cartoonist in Batman, I don't think there's one green thing in the whole thing if you flip through, or in the movies for that matter. Uh, incorporating plants into the urban environment really helps decrease stress levels for people, and it also um, gets more people out on the street. And the more eyes you have on the street, the less crime you have. So there's all kinds of benefits for that. Saving money! Who would have thought but planting trees in your park strip helps increase the value of your home? The U.S. Forest Service says that a mature tree in front of your home can increase the value by 10%. And I like to think, I mean, Silicon Valley, the average home prices are 600, maybe climbing. Um, so if you planted a tree for $100, that's like a 600% gain in value over a long period of time. But it's still better than the stock market, so you know. You should try it. <laughs> uh, park strips, I think, are really important because I think they represent democratic society. They are a public garden space, and everybody accesses them and sees them every day. And I think sometimes people get a little, uh, an attitude that it's a space we shouldn't care about, uh, and they just pave over it, right? Especially if it's, if it's a homeowner and they don't want to deal with it, and it's supposed to be the city's responsibility to take care of that space, it's not mine, right? But I like to think of it in a different light that these spaces are our, all of our gardens and I think Kennedy said it best. You guys know the quote? Mm -hmm. That's not what you can do for your country. Sorry. Yeah, what your country <laughs> can do for you, but yes. what you can do for your country. Ask not what you can do for your country. Or no, no. <laughs> See, <laughs> this is why I wanted you to say it because I put it backwards every time. Ask not what your country. your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So you can take that sentiment and that civic duty that we should all be embracing and put it to practice right here in the park street. And the one reason um, that's very near and dear to my heart why park strip gardens are very, very important is because of water quality. Most people don't realize in the South Bay all of the water that goes down the storm drains goes straight out to the river or your nearest drainage way, and it isn't cleaned. 
uh, in San Francisco and New York, like really, really large cities, there are some places where the water that goes down the storm drain goes into the sewer system, it all goes to the sewer treatment plant and it gets treated and cleaned before it goes out to the waterways. But some of those old cities have had big problems with that system because if it rains really hard and those systems get overloaded, they can't absorb all the water, it backs up into the street and you end up with sewage in people's houses or on the street and nobody wants that. So a lot of those systems or towns that have been newer towns have gone toward a system where it's not connected to the uh, sewer system. Our storm drains aren't connected. And the problem occurs when all of the, I said earlier, lawns are not the best for park strips and this is why. Mm -hmm. When you have sprinklers and the water goes right on off and goes down into the storm drain, it's not only an increase in flow of water at a time when it shouldn't be there, but it also carries all kinds of pollutants. People probably don't see any of that, but I always ask little kids when I'm in an education thing, you know those rainbows in the parking lot that you can see right before it rains? That shimmer of gasoline and oil and all kinds of stuff? That's all washing down this water and into our creeks. Um, litter, dog doo-doo people don't pick up, uh, particles from your car brakes. Every time you push on the brakes in your car, little pieces of copper come off and you can't see that, but that goes into the water's heavy metals. So there's a lot of stuff that gets put in the water that goes down the storm drain and out to our creeks. So it's really sad, but what can we do about it? Here's my little graphic. Okay, so you got the street out here, right? You have your sidewalk and you have the park strip. When you get, and in this, all the water that falls onto this sidewalk goes out to the street and contributes to that larger water quality problem. If you take it away, now all the water that falls on the sidewalk gets trapped in the park strip itself. So you decrease the amount of pollutants and water that goes out into the street. So it seems like a little thing, but it can make a big difference if it was happening all the way across the whole city. So now that you're all encouraged and think park strips are the most important gardens in the whole wide world and want to go do it, I'm going to help teach you how. So the first thing you need to consider is a little bit of planning. They are public spaces and they're not usually the property, the homeowner, it's not usually their property. It's usually city property and even if it is yours, there's probably utility lines that run through there and there's easements and all kinds of things. So before you plant anything in a park strip, you should consult your local city, um, call their planning department, ask them what regulations they have about planting in the park strip. Do you need a permit? That's the first question. In the city of San Jose, you do. It's not hard, it's free, but you do need to get one. And then they have an arborist who comes out and marks where you can put your street tree if you don't have anything in that park strip. And each city has something different. I live in San Jose, so I know their system the best but um, call your city and ask. Is it, is it just trees that you have to worry about? Or is it I'll go through that, yeah. Trees and other things as well. Most, well, I wouldn't say most cities have nice design manuals. This is the city of Seattle. They have a really nice design manual that tells you exactly what you can plant where. Most cities don't have things quite that descriptive, but they do have regulations about what you can plant where in trees and ground covers. So you should look for those ordinances. City of Mountain View, you can go to their website. They have all kinds of questions um, and answers on here. And regardless of what city you live in, some basic principles that you should always consider is if you have power lines in the, above your park strip, you need to plant trees that are gonna be outside of the pruning zone because utility companies for that, um, those electrical lines need to come through and prune anyway. So you, you make their lives easier and yours because it depends on which city. Um, sometimes it's a homeowner's responsibility to take care of trimming those trees and sometimes not. So either way, we help everybody if we plant the right size tree in the space. So if there's power lines, keep it to 25 feet or smaller. Then, the general rule of thumb, although cities could have different, is the plants in the park strip need to be less than three feet tall. And the trees need to be limbed up to about eight feet. And the reason for this is safety. People are walking on this sidewalk 
people are driving out here, they need to be able to see each other. So like if this family is walking down the sidewalk and they come to a driveway, this person doesn't try to, to pull in and can't see them. So it's really important to keep that in mind that the plants in the park strip need to be maintained to these regulations. And check with your city because they might have more stringent, but you should be following those general rule of thumb. Just think of, like if it was my kid, I would want people to be able to see them walking through. So keep that in mind. Like I said, there's a lot of utilities within the right of way. Um, so you should always, it's actually law, before you dig in those spaces, you should call 811. It's free and a person will come out and mark with a spray painted code where all the utilities are within your park strip. So you know exactly where it's safe to, to dig. Do like they so. usually need like just 48 hours notice? I think that, so. Yeah, it's, it's fast. It, yeah, it's really fast. Wish bang, boom, they, they come out and it's completely free. You don't have to pay anybody for it. Other things you should consider in your planning is just your site conditions. It, be surprised how, to, how often people just don't think about how it's different throughout a whole day. For example, in this photo, you can see there's this big shadow because there's a building right here. And in the morning, this space is completely in sunlight, but for the second half of the day, it's completely shaded. So you wanna think about things like that. You may also be planting in locations that already have existing trees. Obviously, it's shadier there. So you need to consider that, as well as roots that you might have to be planting in and around. Or you might be planting in a location that's in full sun all day long with concrete on both sides adjacent that's baking hot. So there's all kinds of conditions that you could be planting a park strip garden in. And you need to think about your particular conditions before you choose the plants that you're going to put in it. So what kind of plants? This is the fun part for all the gardeners out there. Um, you need them to have compact growth. They need to be drought tolerant and at max three feet tall that I was mentioning. They should be tidy so that, this is not the best example, but you get things that start to go out on the sidewalk, they're encroaching on the place people are supposed to walk. So you wanna pick things that you don't have to trim all the time to keep them in that space. Oh, I forgot the tolerant of poor soils. Uh, I'll get into that when I show you the example of my garden and what I did there, but if you're removing concrete, let's just say the soil under there might not even be called soil. Like, <laughs> it's questionable. Dirt. So, yeah. Um, you don't want to pick plants that are very particular to poor soil conditions. And, I guess drum roll, what plants usually fit into this? California natives. Yes, California natives fit very well into this. So I'm going to show you a bunch of different examples of California natives that could fit in a park space, park strip garden. There's many ground cover manzanitas that are good examples. I don't know this actual cultivar in this photo, but there's lots of them to choose from. Is that flower? Uh, manzanitas do flower with a tiny little pink flower. It's not like showy, I would say. And some have more than other like cultivars. I wouldn't plant it for its flowers, although there are a lot of um, birds and bees that do take advantage of those flowers. So it's more for them than I would say the aesthetic of the flowers for people. Flowers in winter. Yes. 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 Flowers in winter. Uh, ground cover baccarus or coyote brush. <clears throat> there are a couple of those that are good, just green ground cover. There's another example of that same coyote brush. Ground cover uh, strawberries are really good if you've got a, a shady situation or you're trying to plant in between roots, you can kind of fit those little guys in there. Ground cover ceanothus, or common name California lilac, sometimes people call it. It's pretty bulletproof, I like that one. Here's another example where it's planted in the park strip. Yes, you know. This one is salvia or sage. Uh, it's a kind called bee's bliss. You can imagine why it's called bee's bliss. And it blooms in the springtime. Mine just started, which is not a good sign. It's a little early. It also uh, spreads pretty wide, like six to eight feet. It could go further. So 
on my list of plants, I gave some general dimensions. Try to keep those in mind and don't, if your park strip's only two feet wide, don't pick the plants obviously that are six to eight feet wide. Or you'll be doing a lot of pruning. There's a lot of native grasses. The blue one is the Festuca idahoensis or switch it around, Idaho fescue. <laughs> um, and then carrots. I think this one looks like junkus. Yeah. junkus. Yeah. It is junkus, effusus, uh, rushes. It's, it's when you get in front of an audience who all know the names that you switch them up. <laughs> uh, deer grass is another excellent example for park strips. They get about three feet tall and wide, the green part, and then the awns above them get taller than that. But I think they're acceptable because these are pretty wispy, and you can still see through them. Hummingbird sage, it does well in the shade or part shade. It'll get crispy if it's too sunny, but here's another picture of it next to the sidewalk. The little guy's here. Douglas iris, if you have a shady spot, they're a pretty bulletproof plant. This one's an example of coral bells or hookara, is the pink flower. And then this is that ground cover ceanothus again. And that one's a carrots, but it's not native probably, right? I don't know. I can't count that all. Know what that means. You could still plant. That's what you're saying. Wildflowers are another option. Um, and they're beautiful in the springtime. I would advise that if you want to do wildflower garden in your park strip, that keep in mind that it looks beautiful like this for about two weeks. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't look like that year round and you have to kind of clean it up afterwards and do some weeding. So if you do want to do wildflowers, it's a great place for them, but maybe plant in some other things in there that you know once the wildflowers are done are going to kind of steal the show later. There's another example of the um, Idaho fescue and poppies. Like I said, only a couple weeks, but they're still, they do so well in such poor conditions. Buckwheats, there's a number of them. This one is the sulfur buckwheat. Saffron, I could be switching those two. No, 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 no. And the rosy buckwheat is the one with pink flowers. So another example of it right there. They're really nice because they stay compact, that like two by two. So if you've got a really narrow park strip, they fit the space really well. However, they are pretty brittle. Like if people, um, if you have high traffic area where people are cutting through all the time, I wouldn't advise them because if they do break off, they don't regrow. But if you're not in a high traffic area, they can be a really bulletproof. Kids that play soccer. Yeah, <laughs> then I wouldn't choose them. Uh, yarrow, the yellow ground, or it's more like a gray green ground cover. And this one has yellow flowers. It's the moonshine variety. Mm -hmm. After it flowers, you can just chop off the flower heads and it makes that nice fuzzy ground cover. Uh, this is just the straight species, the native white yarrow. Verbena, it's kind of short-lived, so I'm, it's not my favorite, but it could be used. It's really showy when it is doing well. It smells great. Yeah. It smells really good. Coyote mint, mm -hmm. I like this one. If somebody rubs up against it, like a hundred yards down, they'll be like, what is that smell? It just lingers and it's like, oh, you hit it a long time ago, but it's the coyote mint. It smells really fragrant and there's a lot of beneficial insects that like it. Penstemon, there's many different varieties of penstemon. This one's a very popular one called Margarita Bop. And I think the bop stands for back of porch. Somebody grew it and named it that. This guy in the background here is the California fuchsia, gray, and it comes in many different varieties. Some are really low growing, some are a little taller. You need to look at the growth requirements of the one that you choose, make sure it's appropriate. But when they flower, 
in the late summer, they have these beautiful red flowers. And the hummingbirds love them. And I'm a big fan of mixing them in because they flower in the late summer, like August, um, when most of the other native plants are not. So they can be a showstopper in a nice time when everything else is dormant. Implementation, how to. This is where we get to the really fun part. So I bought a house in San Jose about five years ago, and the front yard was all lawn. Lawn and concrete, I had a lot of that. And you can see the park strip was the classic case where the homeowner didn't want to deal with the maintenance, so they just paved right on over it. I decided that needed to change. So here's the progression. <laughs> I'll get into how you get into that <laughs> in a second. And clear it all out, plant a tree. And I did something slightly different than I think most people do. If you can tell from here, the soil conditions, like I said, you take up concrete from anywhere and underneath is just a lifeless, I don't, I don't like to say dirt because soil is soil, it's alive, right? But in this condition, it's pretty much dead. So it is dirt, yeah. And you need to bring it back to life in order for plants to do well there. So I planted essentially weeds. I put in alfalfa and mustard, which most people try to get rid of. Mm. But I put the seeded them in this space in the summertime. Uh, I did mustard because it has a very deep tap root, so it could help break up the compaction. And I did alfalfa because it's a nitrogen fixer, help add some nutrients back to the soil. Then I chopped them up mulched over them and put in natives on top. And did you ever rototill at all? No. In that space? That's cool. I let nature do the work. These guys can do the job and I don't have to get out the pickaxe or the like rototiller or anything. I just let them do it. I'm sorry, you said when you used the mustard and the alfalfa, did you do it for a year and then work the soil or just the season in spring? Just the season. I took up the concrete in the springtime, I put down the seed and then I planted in the fall. Yeah. Did you shoot mulch? Yep, getting to it. Okay. You said you chopped up the soil, is that just breaking it up? Chopped up the I chopped up the weeds. Oh, chopped. I thought you said yeah. chopped. Okay. And then that's what it looked like in the springtime. Okay, so how do you do it? <laughs> For all the do-it-yourselfers out there, I'm here as a testament to say, if you're five foot two, you can still use a jackhammer. <laughs> and it's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> seriously, I don't know, maybe I'm just the little girl whose dad always told her, you know, you can't use the equipment, your brothers can do that. And I, I took it to a whole other level. It's like, what kind of power tools can I use next? <laughs> so, uh, jackhammer, you can rent at, um, tool rental places, I think it was like 50 bucks for the day or something, it's not an expensive thing. I got one that you just plug in, bring out an extension cord. It's heavy, that's the one thing, it's heavy, you put it up, you press the button, and it does all the work for you. <laughs> uh, a lot of guys, I asked about this beforehand, like how should I you know, break up the concrete? They were like, oh, you just get out a sledgehammer and you slam it. No, 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 no. This is way easier. It does the work for you. A lot less uh, work on the back. Did you say it's heavy or it's not heavy? It's very heavy. Yeah. That's the only detriment. It's like you, you lift it up, drag it to the next spot, push the button, and then the hardest part is once it's uh, vibrated itself down into a hole is to get it back up and move it to the next spot. And uh, you can be strategic about it. So you start to see the crack line. Like, oh, I'm gonna go there next because it's gonna keep cracking. And I found lovely ways to reuse concrete. I'm a big fan of not taking things to the landfill if we don't have to. So I just have some examples of ways I try to reuse it at my house. That's flagstones in different configurations, loose or put together. And yeah, that was the, the pile in front of my house. <laughs> It migrated taller too, because this was just the front yard. My backyard had like three big patios of concrete that made no sense. So my neighbors were a little upset, I think, probably for the curb appeal for a while, because I had like a ginormous rubble pile in my yard for too long. But yeah. You can also use it in decorative ways. I tried to put it as accent rocks. 
I know. Yeah, a lot of people bring in natural stone into their garden, which looks really beautiful, but you have to think about that had to have come from somewhere else. So if you have materials on site, such as concrete, that could be used for that same purpose, why not? And I also uh, endeavor to make a permeable patio where you put in sand in the joints, so now all the water that comes out of this downspout um, goes down and doesn't drain out. Uh, this one I actually can't say I would recommend for a do-it-yourselfer unless you really, really love puzzles. Like three-dimensional, physically difficult puzzles. Uh, because the bottoms of those pieces of concrete, at least from mine, weren't flat. So it's not only fitting the pieces like this dimension, but trying to get them all to slope exactly 2% pitch away from my house. And it wasn't easy. But it can be done, I suppose. If you, <laughs> you learn the hard way the first time you buy a house, right? Like, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then you're like, next time I pay it, I'm going to do that. <laughs> but then it looks like that at the end. You can also do stacked stone walls. I tried to reuse it any way I could. Sheet mulching. So somebody asked about that. I did sheet mulch. And sheet mulching is what some people call lasagna mulching. You have the layers, you have the, the, in most cases it's a lawn underneath, or for me it was weeds that I had planted myself, then compost, then cardboard, and then uh, wood chips on top of it. You can see, okay, so I have my weeds that I chopped up, and then I added some leaves for composting effects, greens and browns, if you guys are familiar with composting process. I wanted to create a mix that would compost itself. I wet it down, I put cardboard on top of it, and overlaps the layers so that uh, things can't grow up and around, and then put mulch on top of it. And the whole principle is it just shades everything out so nothing grows up because everything below it is covered. If you are starting with a lawn, if you didn't have a concrete park strip, you had a lawn that you needed to get rid of in that space, you could use this method. The only thing I would suggest is, you can see on this side where I did that with my lawn, uh, it starts to sh uh, like slough off onto the sidewalk. It, to avoid that problem, I would just, um, if I were to do it again, would have trenched a little trench on this side so that the mulch has somewhere to fall off into like a low point so it doesn't go on the sidewalk. I still think sheet mulching though is a lot easier for getting rid of a lawn than um, a lot of people just like to sod cut it. Yeah. You can do that, I just think it's more work. And as I've learned with owning my own house, the, the less work, the better. And you didn't have Bermuda grass. I did not have Bermuda grass, no. Thank God. <laughs> um, you do it, and you do it over the summer. You let it go four months in the summer, and all the Bermuda was gone. No water. Yeah. So now that you've prepared your strip, got it ready, you need to know when to plant. And I just wanted to put this up here as a visual in case anybody hadn't noticed. I, a lot of people move to California, right? And they come from places that are a lot wetter and I think they don't realize, and this really shows it. Green line, that's the average precipitation for the United States. Red, that's San Jose. So June, July, August, September, there's not any water coming out of the sky. And people need to realize that when they plant, the ideal time to put plants in the ground is when this curve is going back up, when you start to get those fall rains. Mm -hmm. So in like end of October, November, put your plants in the ground, and then they will take advantage of all this rain that happens to help them get established and rooted. Once again, less work for you. Mm -hmm. Let nature do the work and water them in for you. If you plant them now, <coughs> then they're going into this cycle where they're not gonna see any water for a very, very long time. So you're gonna have to help them along and water them that whole time to get them going. So it'll be more work for you if you wanna keep them from dying. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit about how to properly plant a tree because often park strip gardens involve planting street trees. And as an arborist, I've seen a lot of problems with street trees where people didn't install them right. Really, the most important thing I think is this level of the soil underneath. Uh, a lot of people dig the hole very deep and then you put the plant in and you might end up with it a little too low 
or even if you put soil back in here and tamp it down, you still get where it shrinks afterwards. And that can cause a lot of problems with trees where they get water that builds up right around the base and they'll get rot. So it's really, really important that your, the base of your tree, like when you draw a picture when you were like five years old, the tree goes down and when it gets to the ground, it goes out. That part of the tree needs to be up where you can see it. You don't want it buried. And the other thing is to make your hole three times the dimension of the root ball. So nice and wide. So here's a tree planting in San Jose, getting that hole ready. And if you want to use pickaxes, this is the time you get to do it because soils underneath concrete are usually really fun to start digging in. And then I'm showing this um, volunteer here. When you take a tree out of its container, often they've been in the container for too long and they've got roots that are really root bound. You want to do what I call tickle the root ball, loosen it up. If it's already falling apart, you don't want to do that. But if it's really tight, then you want to help loosen it up a bit. And you also want to find that top of the tree that I was talking about, that part when you were five years old where you draw it starting to go down and out. That's usually buried in the top of the container. You want to dig down gently until you find that. And it's at that elevation that you want to put the tree when you put it in the ground. So right here, they're showing. You've got your hole, and you can use a stick like this to help you make sure that as you're going across, the actual tree's um, main stem is at the right elevation with the ground. Tree staking, if you live in an urban environment uh, with a lot of traffic, using tree stakes like this, um, the triangle, three around it, can help protect your tree from people. But um, I've also seen a lot of cases, I think more than not, where people leave the tree stakes in place for way too long, especially, I'm gonna go backwards. Oops, wrong way. This stake that comes with the tree, don't leave it on the tree because as it grows, the tree will start to try to grow around it. It causes all kinds of damage. So take those stakes off. Install stakes that give the tree a lot of room and the tree should be able to move. If it can't move, it won't develop the wood that helps it stabilize itself. So you have to let it move a little. You're just trying to keep it from like falling over. Um, and then after it's established, like two years, two, three max, take the stakes out. If the tree doesn't need them anymore, it's like training wheels, right? Once you can ride the bike without them, take them off. <laughs> Another thing to keep in mind is, um, protection. So it is a public space and people walk all around it and in it. A park strip is just traffic zone for a lot of people. Uh, so one way to avoid having your plants get trampled is to give intentional places for people to walk. So people do it with step stones. I would say in your design you should always plan to have places like look at your site analysis. If there's a place where people always park their car right next to that door, should put a spot for people to step because if you don't and put a plant there instead, I've cried. I, I have to admit, I've cried more than once about park strip plants that have been smashed. So it helps to think about it in advance. And when it gets smashed more than once, you gotta go like, okay, I get it now. There can be really creative ways to show intentional uh, walking spaces. This one's a garden in Willow Glen, I think maybe Bay Maples? Mm -hmm. Alan Hacker. Alan Hacker yeah. um, did this design and he put uh, logs across like this little uh, dry creek bed. So it's very obvious, right? Where are you supposed to walk? Across the bridge. And it's a, a fun way to get people to encourage people to walk where they should. You can also put up barriers, but you can do it in creative ways. It doesn't just have to be the little uh, fence that everybody's seen that they put around. I think of them as pet cemetery fences, personally. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be more creative about it than that. And there are natural examples where people use stone. And here you can see, um, this is a condition where they're parking the car here. So they intentionally put pavers on this side and didn't plant the whole space, but it still took advantage of some of the planting space and gave a place for people to get out of their cars. It's like, ooh, smart thinking. Mm -hmm. 
that set space and larger. And they mixed it up, you know, put some stones on their sides, intentional places for people to walk. These, uh, this is another one in San Francisco. They used wood pillars. And you can kind of see up underneath here, there's another triangular piece. It creates a little fence barrier. Okay, and then irrigating. So these spaces are usually hot and dry, and if you just plant and walk away, they usually won't survive on their own. So you have to think about how to get them water. Uh, this is a Rainbird sprinkler conversion kit. So if you had a lawn beforehand and you already have sprinklers in that space, you can use this kit and this would be the sprinkler head. You just unscrew it and screw in the new uh, drip conversion thing. And then it has little portals. You just take the little drip hose out to your plants. So it's pretty easy. It's like playing with Tinker Toys. Sometimes putting the little pieces together is harder than I remember from when I was five, but, um, <laughs> but it's a pretty easy way to put in irrigation if you already have sprinkler heads out there. And if you don't use all of your sprinkler heads, you can just, uh, screw a cap on the ones you're not using just to close them off. And I have this other neat invention. So, well, it's not my invention. I saw somebody else do it. If you don't have sprinklers or irrigation line that already go out to your park strip, it's kind of daunting to think like, how am I gonna take the sprinklers underneath <clears throat> the sidewalk? You can do that, but it's a pain in the butt to get permissions and get the line underneath. So another way to do it is to just set up this little contraption where you have the uh, valve box and the, this is the filter you can kind of see there. It's a drip kit. And then up this side, this is just a hose bib. So you're gonna screw a hose in here. Show a picture. Okay, so that's when it's working. So if your garden is like, let's imagine, there's the sidewalk here and you have a hose bib on the other side. You just connect your hose on your side and then go over and connect the other end into here and then start running. And the line comes up and you can see right here, it pops out and then goes to the drip. So you're just like making that magic connection in between somewhere where you've got water and somewhere where you want it to be without having to make a permanent connection. It's kind of like a temporary, I'm gonna bridge the gap with a hose. I know Alex Bonfeld with uh, Actera. Oh, she yeah. does that a lot at school gardens because they oh, don't have right. access um, yeah, to the water either. So it's, it's good. Yeah, it's a, I guess cheaper and easier than trying to install a whole permanent irrigation system. And with a lot of natives, you'd only have to do that for a couple of years. With yeah, some, with some. Exactly, Sherry pointed out that with a lot of natives, you water for the first three years or so, and you can taper it off. In the park strip space, I would say it's super hot. Depending on your conditions, it might not be that you can realistically think that after three years, you're never gonna have to water again, but it's not like a lawn. It doesn't need water every day. You know, with natives, what I do, I don't actually have this system. I use what one of my professors at Foothill College called the beer method. I take a hose myself. I don't actually drink a beer, but it sounds like <laughs> more fun, right? And you, you water them yourself with the hose. And I'm more just a, enjoying my garden and talking to my neighbors. And if you only have to do it every two weeks or so, two to three, um, and I try to give each plant like five to 10 gallons, you wanna get deep waterings. So you encourage roots to go down deep. It's not a big time commitment for a small space if that's the only place you're having to hand water. But if you don't want to, you can just hook up this hose on this system. So there's the hole where you're going to take the hose across, hook it in there, then the drip lines that are going through. And this is what it looks like when it's finished. All you have is this little box with the lid. So it's not, um, it's more aesthetically pleasing. And it's, it's hidden. The irrigation is pretty much hidden. And uh, finally, just resources for other places. I don't know it all. I've done my park strip and a couple of others, but I'm sure there are, within this audience, there's probably people who know way more than I do about how to do park strip gardens. 
Um, there's lots of good resources. The California Native Plant Society, obviously, and Sherry mentioned the going or the garden gardening with natives forum. All kinds of questions you can ask on there. There's tons of experts who gladly volunteer their time basically to answer anything you want to know about natives, which is really, really great. Um, I've volunteered with an organization in San Jose called Our City Forest. They're the urban tree forest organization in San Jose. They're kind of partnered with the city and they do street, street tree installations and they have been doing more um, park strip gardens as well. And they have a nursery, if you're interested, kind of near the airport in San Jose where they have lots of natives trees and all kinds of plants. Your local library, obviously, if you're in a lecture like this, you're taking advantage of that, but they have lots of wonderful resources and books and lectures and things. And I looked up, I'm not familiar with the organization, but in Mountain View, there's a um, just getting on its feet nonprofit called Mountain View Trees that I assume is similar to our city forest, but just for particular to Mountain View. Does anybody know about that group? Yes, yeah, yeah. They're, they're pretty active. I, I would say it's probably analogous to a city forest. Okay. It might be smaller. Yeah. Palo Alto has one called Canopy. Yeah, Canopy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Canopy. Yeah. Yeah. So I just started one. Oh, cool. So there's lots of nonprofit tree organizations out there. Reach out to your local one and they can answer all kinds of questions, particularly to the um, trees and ordinances in your city. If you can't find the person at the city to answer your question about like what kind of street trees are allowed and heights, and usually the nonprofit tree organization that partners or um, they know all of that and can are sort of more user friendly, I suppose, in answering questions sometimes. Are we good on time? I have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, yeah, like. yeah, that's great. Yeah.